Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 328 of the Small Business Show here. We have a fantastic guest for you today, and I don't yeah. say that lightly. Could be the best small business show we've ever recorded, right? Uh, Could be. Certainly, uh, it's up there, man. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah, I, um, I'm always hesitant when we bring on guests that are in the, you know, entrepreneur coach realm, but... That, he's not really a coach, but right? he's, he's not. He's no, got but a it's, mission. He's yes, got, he's on this mission, That's and the way he puts it together. And he's an author, and uh, uh, I think his his message certainly, uh, you know, melds with uh, and promotes what we've been talking about over the past six years. And I know everyone who listens is going to get something powerful and positive out of this show. There, there are, there is at least one phrase that he shares that you will hear us integrate into the show. Like we, uh, like we have with, with many others over the years, like this, this might come to the top of the list. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You got to listen. You got to hear him say it first before you hear Shannon and I just like jump all over it and, and, and share the love. But, uh, but yeah, Trey, Trey's on to something here. I think it's going to be a great show. I think you're yeah, going to love it. I'm definitely yep. going to steal it and, uh, and oh, definitely. Ampl amplify it because uh, yeah. it's just a great concept that encapsul encapsulates what we talk about so much. And it, even more so know. than, than you know, the, the one of our other mantras, which is, you know, don't make fear-based decisions. I love that one. I still love that one. What you're about to hear, I think might top it. So there you go. Yeah, I'm ready, dude. I'm ready to small business. I'm excited to listen to the interview and I'm excited to see what everyone thinks. I'm ready to small business too. He is Shannon Jean. I'm Dave Hamilton. And this is episode 328 of the Small Business Show. I wrote the book and thank you for saying that. So anyone who's listening right now is likely in the position that they are in for years, if not decades of, of work, right? They've made decisions. They've chosen to maybe build walls around themselves in some literal or metaphorical way. They've, uh, they've suffered the consequences of what they thought might be good decisions and it had unexpected results that they were forced to deal with. So if it took us years to get to the point where we are, we have to accept that, that becoming an entrepreneur and not an employee is a process. And just as you constructed those walls, you have to realize that it's a process to deconstruct those walls. So the book is about getting you to stop thinking and living like an, like an employee and start thinking and living like an entrepreneur. And that's simply not something that you can wake up one day and say, yesterday I was an employee, today I'm, I'm a you know, full-time entrepreneur. It is a process. So you can unstick yourself gradually over time because that's how you first got started. Hey there. So over the last six seasons on the Small Business Show, our listeners know we always discuss tactics and actions required to, to make the jump from just being an employer, or I'm sorry, an employee to an employer. Uh, how to get out of the comfort of that nine to five job to start your own business and to create the charmed life that Dave and I talk about all the time. Our guest today is a true believer. He's on a quest, a mission, if you will, to rescue 1 million entrepreneurs from traditional employment. Trey Williams has escaped employment and founded several companies. He's helped other business owners franchise their concepts, and he's led several franchise companies to success. Trey, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, really. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about the conversation. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm really glad you're here to talk about entrepreneurship with us and to tell us about your mission. And uh, we're going to talk about a book that, you, that you've uh, written as well called Boss Brain. So let's get a little background to our listeners uh, before we jump into other topics. Give us a quick rundown how you got started uh, working you know, in, in your own businesses as well as then uh, working with other entrepreneurs. Yeah, so I grew up in a uh, largely rural environment in the, the sort of sticks of southeastern Georgia, if you can't tell by the accent. And um, <laughs> I like the sticks. I, uh, I'm a big fan. <laughs> no, the, st is. the sticks are good. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I actually grew up about 10 miles from a red light. So I was I was pretty out there in the sticks. And um, it's strange to say, but I really think out there in the middle of nowhere is a great place to have entrepreneurship sort of imbued into your personality because no one's has now hiring signs up 
right? No one is is trying to give you a job, and there aren't really uh, low hanging fruit or readily available opportunities. So you're forced to manufacture ways to to generate income and to supplement maybe the income that you have. And and I think that's really where I got that mindset and earned that mindset. My um, my mother made ceramics when we were a kid, and we used to sell them beside the street at Christmas time. And we sold all of the extra vegetables out of our garden that we couldn't freeze or eat. And and, and sort of supplementing and creating these side hustles just was part of who I was growing up as the youngest of four. So I really think that's where it began. Yeah, that's that's great. It's out of necessity, right? I, purely out yeah. of necessity. But 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 when you're in necessity, you know no other type of world. So you think that's purely how the world exists. Yeah. So by the time I did receive W two employment, I had that sort of hustle on the side mentality just burned into my psyche. So I yeah. continued throughout. That's the key, isn't it? Having that, you, you know, this is a, this is a business. The, the entrepreneurship business is for people who have that burned into them. I, I, and, and you can certainly burn it in after the fact, but it needs to be burned in at some point to kind of get you through those tough moments of being an entrepreneur, right? It, it does. And, and if you don't have that burned in early, I think you still feel that drive later in life. And the statistics yeah. show that, right? Studies prove that. Totally. Um, totally. Except you've never, except you've not converted that sort of inspiration into action. That's, yeah. And that's what we talk about here all the time, yes. man, because it's all about taking action, isn't it? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. It all begins there. Certainly. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, and I, I think that's a, a, a good point to uh, focus on is, you know, you're used to this uh, this type of entrepreneurial cycle and, and starting companies and everything else, and it puts you in a, a, a good position to help other people that perhaps have dreamed about doing it, but didn't grow up and, and didn't you know evolve in that space uh, where that's just the way things were. No, for certainly. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel blessed to have had that opportunity and, and to have thought of that just as a natural part of life. Um, you know, but the the systems that America uses to to educate and, and mature us also turn us into employees, right? There's no there's yeah. no coincidence that the school day matches the work day, right? Or that bells that tell us to change class when we're in middle school uh, turn into alarms that go off on our phone to tell us when the next meeting is. So it, it's really designed to to churn you in and create or, or to burn this in and then churn out employees. And it's kind of a relic of the industrial revolution. And, and I get why it was originally created, but it, it needs to be enhanced and revised at this point because it's become uh, somewhat self-defeating now because entrepreneurship is in such decline. So yes. I, I have a question for you yeah. I, because this, what you're describing, I, I mean, I certainly believe in it. I see it. I actually just finished teaching my first semester of a college class. Now it was a class of, of it. I, I was in there because I'm an entrepreneur, not not just as a teacher, because I'm definitely not a teacher. But <laughs> right. but but what you're pointing out, like, it's true, like these things all just sort of lead people down this path. And is it and they teach you not to sort of bang into the walls too hard and, and you know, just sort of stay the course. Now, for some of us, that doesn't work, right? And that's th that's what we're talking about here. But do you think we've said on this show many times and, and feel free to disagree with us, but we've said on this show many times that it takes both types of people. It takes employees and employers to make the world go round and both types are OK. Like there's nothing inherently wrong. Of course. Of okay. course. Yeah. My work in no way is meant to vilify the idea of being a W-2 employee. Sure. Um, my, my work is really centered around the balance between those two. And I'll give you my standing metaphor for this. So imagine it's 2000 years ago. You're standing on the shore of some, uh, some land far off and you decide that you want to build a raft. And you want to sail beyond the horizon because out there you think there's something better for you that where you'll flourish and you can leave a legacy and create a family and have all the things that we want out of life. Sure. Simultaneously, there is likely somebody in your village standing on the beach looking at you going, what are you doing? This looks like the dumbest idea I've ever seen in my life. And that's okay for both. Because Mother Nature wired us in a way so that we had to have balance. And the, what, the reason behind this is it kept us all, it prevented us all from jumping on that raft, 
sailing into the void and sinking and killing the species. Right. right there had to be sometimes some you jump on that raft on. and it doesn't go where it doesn't go. Uh, well. Sometimes oh, yeah. it sinks. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's right. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Certain sometimes percentage need to stay back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but my work really is centered around the fact that in today's world or today's America, I should say, 93% of us are now working for the other 7%. And I would, I would argue that that is not balance, mm. right? So there's this tremendous skew in the direction of traditional employment. And it has been cut in half in the past uh, 25 years. It has been cut by 90% or so in the past century. So we see this precipitous decline in, in, in uh, excuse me, in entrepreneurship, and it's coupled really with the rise of the middle class and with the, the rise of the quality of life in America. And this is true in every other country as well. So yeah. in a way, we've become victims of our own success. Yeah, and, I get it. Yeah, um, I also think that uh, I've seen this uh, – embracing a certain thing in our society that that I didn't really didn't notice that much maybe 10 years ago 15 years ago and and that is the embracing of safety uh we want things to be safe we want to be sure that you know uh, things are taken care of and and I think that the concept of things being safe is is kind of you know, the opposite of what a lot of entrepreneur entrepreneurship is all about, right? You have to create, you're starting at zero often, uh, every, often every day. And um, one of the things I see too, that I wanted to ask you about is that this, this rise of gig workers, you know, these people that are doing their own thing, but, but under an umbrella of another company, whether it's uh, Instacart, Uber, DoorDash, whatever it is. And, I've talked to some of those people that kind of consider themselves to be a small business person, or an entrepreneur, but working under that. Do you, do you think that you could do you consider those folks entrepreneurs or are they just is that just another form of employment? Yeah, you know, I do consider them entrepreneurs and I actually consider the people that have found themselves stuck and locked in traditional employment to be entrepreneurs that just need to be rescued. Mm, like right. That. So that yeah. we 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 still have the same mentality, this distribution. So here's why I consider them entrepreneurs. A study was done in 2018 and 70% of the American workforce indicated that they would prefer to be self-employed. That's a hundred million people. So yes, that they are entrepreneurs in their mind and they feel stuck and they feel like they were meant for something more than what they're currently living. And to be honest with you, I still call them entrepreneurs and I want to help them escape that the, the bonds of that employment that they're in. So I most definitely consider gig workers and supplemental workers to be entrepreneurs. It doesn't necessarily mean that you pay all your bills that way. There've been many times in my life where I was a W-2 employee, sure. but there've been very few times in my life where I wasn't also working on something else that I hoped to eliminate that, that traditional uh, employment. Yeah. I, okay. So I, yeah, I know. I like this. It, it, that it, it, it the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Yeah. I, I mean, it, and, and, and point. as as many entrepreneurs have learned that like you, you have to start your side hustle as a side <laughs> hustle and then it can become <laughs> right. your, your, your main hustle. Right. But the, right. You know, that's why it's called a side hustle. That's why it's called a side <laughs> hustle. But if you're doing a side hustle, you're still an entrepreneur. In fact, you're like perhaps the very essence of an entrepreneur, right? Like that's the key I, of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I opened the book talking about this ancient battle in our brains. And the reason the book is called Boss Brain is the, the battle is between this hardwiring in your brain, the optimist side of your brain. And that's really your boss brain. That's the side of you mm. that wanted to build that raft and sail beyond the horizon. And, and because we all have that to some extent, some or more than others, there's also there's more modern brain that seeks what you, you said earlier ab about certainty. Right. Our brains crave and love certainty. Oh, yeah. And it has been proven over and over again. And if, if it hadn't will... been, the last year certainly proved it to us. <laughs> uh, yeah. The last year really knocked it out of the park to prove that what you think is safe and predictable is actually not. But the, right. but the point is, is our brains really have this ancient battle happening between optimism and certainty. And 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 if we are craving certainty, and it really has diminished and, and smothered our inherent optimism. And that's what's causing this skew. So the battle in your brain is ancient. You've been fighting it for million, you know, for millennia of years here since our brain came into existence 100,000 years ago or so. And, and we feel this today for a really good reason. Um, 
So let's let's say that traditional employment in the sense that we know it, where you go to school, you go to college, you get a job, you work 40 years, buy a house, get a gold watch. If you condensed the existence of our brain down to 60 seconds, that mantra, that, that linear path I just described to you would exist for 0.4 of those seconds. Hmm. So the existence of your brain ticked away for 59.6 seconds until we asked it to deal with this question, right? And we're how could we not feel conflicted, right? How could we not feel like, gosh, I know this is something I want to do, but I really want the certainty, but I have this vision of the future of what lies beyond the, the shores where I want to sail away from. So th- this feeling is very natural. And I want to tell entrepreneurs, this is not unique to you. Don't feel miserable unless you just want to share that misery with everybody because it's <laughs> what we all feel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this is great. All right. Um, I want to take a minute here and talk about our sponsor for this episode. All right. Yeah, our sponsor today is Custom Comet. So they are a Portland-based company that makes custom merch and promotional products that we can use in our businesses. They actually sent us some of their stuff and they like they sent us some stickers with small business show logos on them, which are awesome. They also make air fresheners, coasters, coffee sleeves, patches, pins, and more. Their most popular product is these custom air fresheners, and they're one of the only companies that creates custom shapes for every order. So the air freshener is like our sticker shaped like your logo or artwork. Most companies only allow to use like 10 or so stock shapes, not custom Comet. They let you do whatever shape matches what you're looking for, and they carry over 70 different scents. I checked out the new car scent one. Smells awesome. And 17 different string colors, so you can really, really match it up. They use this three-layer process to make them. They have this uh, cotton core to suck up the fragrance. And that's sandwiched between printing paper to keep it, like, really crisp. And it's great. Really, really nice stuff. And they offer retail packaging options if you want to sell them. Of course, if not, you know, you can get them in, like, a normal packaging. And then you just distribute them to your customers or however you want to do it. They focus at Custom Comet on using high-quality materials And they know that every business is the customer service business, and they focus on stellar customer service, too. They provide free design help. They are a company that was founded by artists and graphic designers. So they're there, and they can do everything to make sure your project looks great. And if you mention that you heard them here on the Small Business Show... You get 5% off your first order. So let Custom Comet help your brand create a unique and memorable promotional product. Visit customcomet.com, C-U-S-T-O-M-C-O-M-E-T.com. And our thanks to Custom Comet for sponsoring this episode. All right, Shannon, take it away. Yeah, so I want to, I I really believe in this concept that you're espousing here, this you know, with these kind of hidden entrepreneurs that are working for other people and trying to break them free. So, you know, and it seems like just this vast chasm for so many people to to jump over, to leave maybe that safety or perceived safety, which I always say, because you're, you're at the whim of someone else that's, you know, issuing a paycheck. What are your thoughts about this process of being stuck there? And, and, and I, I would just... Can we safe? Can I safely say that was one of the reasons you you wrote Boss Brain was to try to train these Absolutely. people to to switch things up and dr- and and don't just dream about it. I mean, how do they make take those first steps? It's exactly the reason why I wrote the book, and thank you for saying that. So, anyone who's listening right now is likely in the position that they are in for years, if not decades. Of, of work, right? They've made decisions. They've chosen to maybe build walls around themselves in some literal or metaphorical way. They've, uh, they've suffered the consequences of what they thought might be good decisions, then that had unexpected results that they were forced to deal with. So if it took us years to get to the point where we are, we have to accept that, that becoming an entrepreneur, not an employee, is a process, And just as you constructed those walls, you have to realize that it's a process to deconstruct those walls. So the book is about getting you to stop thinking and living like an like an employee and start thinking and living like an entrepreneur. And that's simply not something that you can wake up one day and say, yesterday I was an employee. Today I'm I'm a full time entrepreneur. It is a process. So you can unstick yourself gradually over time because that's how you first got stuck. I like it. I I also. 
like the emphasis on the the living part of it as well and the thinking because it is an entire system uh, of y- your thought process, how you frame things, how you embrace you know failure uh, and and how you recover from failure, right? Because it's not you know nothing is guaranteed when you get out there and you're going to have to struggle through uh, some hard times, right? Well, f- failure is part of the process. Yeah. So in the in the second portion of the book, as we're illuminating is entrepreneurial instincts that I'm helping people unlock. We talk a lot about embracing the fact that failure is is both inevitable and should be viewed upon as a positive opportunity. And oh, even yeah, absolutely. as cla- classical conditioning would tell me that it, failure made you smarter. Of and, course, uh, we call it tuition. And, and anyone man. who's never... Well, and, and look, hey, anyone who hasn't failed in small ways along during their journey is likely to fail in a big way at the end because oh. they haven't experienced it and learned how to, to learn. From oh, yeah. No, we, we sure, put out man. a book. We put out a book last year called uh, We Love Mistakes. And it's exactly this. <laughs> I love so it's it. like, yeah. As Shannon just said, we call our mistakes our tuition. Now, we mainly call them that so that we can justify what they've cost us. But but they really are the things that teach us. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, Trey, since, you know, we love mistakes so much and we talk about them all the time uh, and I'm so good at making them. Um, can you share, join the club? Yeah. Can you share one of the, of, of your, and I'm, you know, my quote signs in the air, your best mistakes that really taught you something important in your career. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something that harkens back to when I was very, very young and I've made this mistake a few times, but this was the first time I make it. I, I, I started a restaurant when I was in my early twenties oh. and, um, <laughs> right? I feel for yeah. you, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started a restaurant in my early early twenties. It was a Cajun concept that that had blues music and you know all the things you would expect to go along with a New Orleans. New Orleans Sounds theme. fantastic, yeah. Right. Well, I happen to be a huge blues fan, so I had this idea that everyone should love blues, and this was a Cajun concept, and I was only going to have blues music played here. And as it turns out, fellas, not everybody likes everything that I like. And, and I've learned this lesson painfully then, um, and, and over and over that what is a priority for me and what I prefer really should play very little in the the strategic growth of my company. It should be based on uh, the the needs of your customer, uh, what they need you for and why they need that thing, not what I'm trying to educate them on or force them to like. Um, you I can made the pepper same your stuff in every now and then, right? You know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I did my best to to balance it out, but I made this same mistake as a W two employee at the head of a large beverage franchise. I, um, I decided very early in '08 or '09, before everyone realized how bad sugar was for you, that I wanted to lead the charge of this. Uh, 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 stevia type sweetened beverage so that we could eliminate the the large amounts of sugar that were in our beverages. And it turns out most people just didn't care. Yeah. And, and, and then now you call me ahead of my time, call me, whatever we failed. And people just did not care. They didn't want to pay a premium for that. It of course cost a premium because healthy food costs more. Yeah. And I learned that lesson again, that it was a priority for me and what I needed to be focused on was what is my customer's priority and why, why do they need me? And I've learned that one several times. And uh, it's tough to give up your own preferences. It's tough to go against what you personally would choose and do what is best for your customers instead. Yeah, that's a great, that's a good lesson. Uh, yeah. One of the things that, uh, you know, doing a little research for the show here, and one of the, the terms or phrases that I noticed on your website a few times that was kind of interesting to me, where you say the gap between entrepreneurship and employment uh, is, is its largest in history. What do you mean by that? So I can understand it a little better. Yeah, sure. So in the early 1940s, the percentage of self-employed Americans hovered almost 30%. Among, uh, among immigrants, it was even higher than that. It still is today, should be noted. Immigrants have a huge entrepreneurial spirit, yeah, and sure. no wonder they would want to come here. Um, by... Uh, the 70s, that number had fallen to, say, 20%, a little bit less, 18, 19. As late as the Clinton second term in the late 90s, it was around 12 or 13%. And 
Today, it has been cut in half in 20 years. So we're about 7% or so self-employment in America. And if you follow that trajectory, guys, follow that exact same trajectory from the late 90s until now, it means that sometime in the mid-2040s, 99% of America is going to work for the other 1%. Oh, that's scary. And that is that is a hell of a gap, especially in a country where 100 million of us have already admitted that we would prefer to be self-employed. So think about what it means for there to be a tenfold difference between those who are thinking it and those who are doing it. Yeah. And that's where the entrepreneurship gap lives. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's a sobering thought. It man. is. Yeah. It is. Uh, so uh, you you wrote so you wrote the book Boss Brain, and uh, is is there any other is you know systems or processes involved? And in, you know people can the book is on pre order. Is that correct? They can they can pre order. Yeah. Website? So we just finished up a big pre order launch okay. last month, and uh, the book itself is going to be available in a few months. So and okay. through the through regular traditional means. Sure. Uh, in the interim, uh, they can always go to TreyWilliams.com and gain more information, have the opportunity to s- snatch down a, a free sample for themselves. That's great. Yeah. I, um, but the, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, the, but the systems within it are are really part of a larger effort that I'm, I'm making, working with Chambers of Commerce, Economic Development yeah. Councils, That's because great. while I, I like to work with the individual entrepreneur, and that is most definitely the, the best way to affect change, I... Um, I've grown weary of doing it one at a time and I wanted to do it faster, just like I want to do everything in my life. And I've had some success working with some municipalities who embrace the need for the balance that we talked about at the outset to to recapturing that balance between employers and employees. That is great. Uh, I commend you for giving back. That's a, it's, it's huge. It's one of the reasons why we do this show. Not We just don't like to hear our own voices, but uh, that too, but uh, try to help other, (laughs) other people. Um, And, you know, I have this kind of aspirational listener in in my head that I'm talking to all the time, and it's this person that just wants to go out and start this business, and we're just trying to help them, just give them that push that uh, that they need. If if someone would come up and ask you, based on your experiences and and creating the book, which is an education in itself, I know. Um, if they were to ask you, you know, what's the most critical thing I can do, the most critical action I can take to kind of break the the chains of employment uh, to start their own business. What do you tell them? I tell them that belief is reverse engineered. So the, uh. the longer the longer we wane in in sort of the the laws of traditional employment, knowing or feeling as if we were meant for self employment, the less we believe in the inevitability or even in the possibility that that might ever happen. Yeah. And the only way to recapture that belief is to take action. And that's what I say by reverse engineering. Very often people feel as if they need to believe something will happen before they'll take action. When the truth is the way to recapture that belief that you once had is to just do something, right? Design that logo, form that LLC, call the local library and try to join a group of, of entrepreneurs who are supporting each other. If you just take action today, then that yields a result and that yields another result. And over time, it isn't the results that change your belief. It's you begin to view yourself as a person of action and a person who will eventually succeed. So belief is reverse engineered, guys. I can't say it more clearly. If if I had a bell at my desk, I'd be like, ding, 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 ding. You know, and uh, (laughs) it it is absolutely the truth. You know, we, we talk about creating your own story here all the time. That that's it. You know, it's it's wrapping your head around this concept and this framing how you frame things and and you know really rewiring it. I love the reverse engineering now. No, that's it. Yeah, Shannon uh, Shannon taught me a long time ago that the it, it, an easier way. I don't want to say it's easy, but an easier way to get to where you want to be is to decide what story you want to tell at the end, yep. and then you live your life to tell that story. And you're oh, like, I love it. Right. Yeah. yeah Cause I you have a great. choice. You, you have a choice and, and you see people around you. You're like, Oh boy, that's a cautionary tale. I don't want to do that. Don't want that. You know? And, and for me, uh, I, I'm, you know, kind of a first generation entrepreneur and I didn't want to be that flaky person that was always trying something new and didn't work out. And I was like, Oh boy, I don't want to be that, that dinner table talk. Like what's this guy doing now? So it just drove me to be successful <laughs> at least 
at least to be successful enough to where I could tell the story. You know, now many yeah, of, many yeah. of my businesses didn't work out right, but they were still learning. That's probably why we say, oh, mistakes are tuition, because it, again, it's part of yeah. my story. <laughs> So. Yeah, well, Shannon, you only got to be right once. Yeah, right? that's <laughs> true. You can be wrong. No, quite true. A bit. You can you can and, be wrong and, a lot more than you can than you need to be right. Uh, it's totally that's, true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And there's an entire chapter in the book about how we use our own personal narratives. And to to your point, but the bad news is sometimes we use them as a limiting factor. Yeah. Right. Sometimes we use those personal narratives to create this perspective and say, well, I'm not the kind of person who ever succeeds, and I always fail at what I do. And, and and without that resilience and that diligence, really, you do remain stuck where you are. So that personal narrative and that story you tell yourself is so important. And I, I love the idea of starting in the beginning to to say not just what you're going to do, but why you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. It, this this is such an important show. Uh, and, you know, we're going to highlight it over and over. And I'm going to print that phrase you said about reverse engineering on a T-shirt. Uh, because it's so powerful and it's often overlooked uh, by the nuts and bolts. You know, you made a comment about do any, you know, when I asked that ax- action question, you're just like, just do something. And you made a comment about designing the logo. And I can remember, you know, I've had lots of partners over time. And one of the first things I always like to jump into when I'm thinking about a new company is to what would the logo look like? What would be the color scheme? And I've had folks that, I'm no longer partners with, that would be, oh, that's a waste of time. We don't need that yet. But I need it, right? Because it's yeah. it's, right. it's convincing me, like, this is a cool logo. So it's that reverse engineering, that 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 story and the concept. And, and Trey, I, I can't thank you enough for, uh, you know, coming on the show and, and talking about that concept and, you know, sharing your story about writing Boss Brain. And uh, it's, it's just really powerful stuff. Well, it really is a passion of mine and one that I, I could talk about all day. And I appreciate you guys letting me get on my soapbox here for a little while because I, I take this mission very, very seriously. And I hope one day when I'm no longer around that the momentum behind this movement continues. And I, I would be honored to say that I was able to positively affect the lives of others and, and help them feel as blessed as I feel now. So yeah. it's uh, truly my honor to be here. And thank you guys for for doing the work that you do every day and allowing me to contribute. Yeah, that's really great. We, we love it. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you uh, and to learn more about Boss Brain? So you can always go to treywilliams.com, which is T-R-A. It's spelled strangely, T-R-A Williams.com. And you can learn a lot about me and the things that I do. And from there can connect with me in a variety of social media. I, I love speaking with aspiring entrepreneurs and it's my favorite thing in the world to get in for, into a room filled with can-do people. Um, that's, that's dangerous in a good way when you get those <laughs> kind of single-minded folks together. And it's always my favorite thing to do. So I would welcome your listeners to reach out. I'd love to have conversations with you. That's awesome. Well, Trey, thank you again. Please keep in touch. Uh, we'd love to check in from you time to time and uh, be well, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Man, you know, I am so glad we did that interview, Shannon. I, I, Me too. I am always a little bit leery of people that fall into the realm of coaching other business owners, right? Sometimes, in, yeah. Yeah, Sometimes. I mean, just Me too. in general, it, it, it has been more failure than success. Although, as Trey said, you only need to have one success or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think this one uh, certainly falls into the category of success. What a great well, guy, great conversation. Yeah, four words. Belief is reverse engineered. I love it. And that is a great mantra to think about. It is, you know, it encapsulates this concept that we talk about all the time about writing your own story and you get to pick and all that kind of stuff. And these, the more you can hear this and the more you can train your inner judge, your inner narrator, the more success you're going to find no matter what you do. So uh, no matter what, I'm yeah, absolutely. thrilled to have him, have him on the show. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you folks. If you liked what Trey had to say, or if you have some different ideas, feedback at business Um, if you really enjoyed the show, in wherever you're listening, please go leave us a review and then let us know when you leave that review because we'll talk about it on the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Make sure you uh, you check out Custom Comet, of course, at customcomet.com. And uh, keep living that charmed life, will you? 